Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me to give this presentation here at this um, great meeting, um, which unfortunately is not going to happen in person this year. Um, uh, my name is Jan Klaassen. I'm an associate professor of neurology and director of critical care neurology at Columbia University. Um, I was asked today to talk in this, um, this, um, this part, talking on sedation about electrophysiological monitoring in paralyzed patients. These are my disclosures. It's importantly, is my, my funding agencies, the NIDS, NIH, um, and uh, foundation funding. Um, I'm a minority shareholder at ICE Neurosystems, which does not really directly apply to this talk. So if we talk about sedating uh, patients in the ICU, this is incredibly common throughout the world. Um, we have to think about what are the challenges in guiding sedation in the ICU. In general, general anesthesia causes a reversible state of unconsciousness. Um, adequate sedation, however, is challenging to judge. We know this from um, op the operating room, where rarely there can be a case of awareness during surgery, even though the patient received sedation. Um, we know that particularly in paralyzed patients, as they cannot express with their motor um, uh, with their um, with movements that they are conscious, it, it may be challenging to titrate exactly to the right amount that is required to cause unconsciousness, but not to over sedate. The goal would be to find the sweet spot in between under and over sedation. Under sedation may cause psychological trauma, uh, what I just talked about. Self extubation may be seen, aspiration, delirium. Um, the patient may remove central lines, other things. Over sedation may be, uh, may be problematic because it's also been associated with causing delirium. Uh, longer days of mechanical ventilation are a strong predictor of worse outcome, um, and it may, it, may relate, it may cause hypotension depending on what agent is used. <clears throat> the required sedation level, level may be individually influenced by the age of the patient, renal hepatic uh, function, by brain injury, by many other factors. And so finding the exact right level of sedation is not straightforward. Can the EEG help in this, um, in this question? So I'll talk about this. Changes in the EEG with levels of sedation are predictable. So this is the hypothesis here. Um, you can see here that in different states of anesthesia, there are changes that clearly can be seen from um, excitation here all the way down to burst suppression and isoelectric um, EEG, which you can actually generate, for example, of course you can get it with coma or brain death, but you can also cause it with high doses of barbiturates. So the EEG changes with sedation. However, is that the only way that the EEG changes? So EEG is sensitive, but not very specific. So brain perfusion can also cause changes in the EEG. You can see here, along this uh, spectrum of chain dropping brain perfusion that the EG also changes similarly to those changes seen with sedation in a predictable way. Um, ICP hydrocephalus can, can cause changes in the EG, focal injuries, strokes, bleeds, any of those, cardiac arrest, hypoxia can cause changes in the EG, and seizures can cause seizures, uh, changes in the EG. So it's not specific, but it's highly sensitive. In summary, EEG reflects neural activity. EEG is predictable, um, uh, has predictable changes with increased sedation. What is the mechanism underlying this? So that's not completely understood yet, but quite a bit was worked out in patients with disorders of consciousness, with injury to the system, where it seems that with changes in the thalamocortical, so between the thalamus and the cortex, that connection, if that is changed to different degrees, if that is altered, impaired, then the EEG changes in a predictable way. This is the spectrogram, so slow frequencies are here and high frequencies are here. You can see that in completely dissociation between the cortex and the thalamus, there's only, it's very, very flat and there's very little activity here. You can see slow frequencies with severe differentiation and then in normal brain, you have like nice peaks here in the higher frequency ranges. So the, that's, that might be underlying this, these changes. How can we analyze the EEG and utilize this in the ICU? So you can take the EEG, you can do a fast Fourier transform, which takes different frequencies in the EEG. 
uh, slow frequencies and high frequencies. Here you can see that it breaks it down into slow and high frequencies. And then you can express this in color maps over time. So this is time. Here are slow frequencies, high frequencies, and the color indicates the power in these diff different frequency spectra. So you can see that something happened here. This, in this case, was a seizure, and you can see this easily on this spectrogram plot. You can analyze the EEG by spectral power. <clears throat> so here you can see that with different levels of anesthesia here, no anesthesia, and then deeper stages of anesthesia, you can see that the um, EEG power in the alpha frequency changes here. It relocates from the back of the brain in conscious patients that are not under uh, anesthesia to going to the front in patients that are anesthetized. You can look also at coherence, which basically just looks at how one electrode correlates with another electrode. And that can be displayed here in a nice color map, patient before anesthesia, going under, during anesthesia, emergence, and then the patient is emerged. You can see that the alpha coherence is first in the back of the brain, then relocates to the front of the brain, and then when the patient is re-emerged, is in the back of the brain again. So if you look at different anesthetics, the EEG spectrogram signature is specific to those anesthetics. Much of this work has been uh, worked out by Emory Brown's group at MIT. Um, and you can see here examples for propofol, for example, where the spectrogram plot shows especially delta and alpha oscillations. You can see that for zevofloran, it looks slightly different. There's much more sort of this constant slow alpha, delta, and theta oscillations here. In ketamine, an NMDA inhibitor, it looks completely different. You have these high frequency oscillations here. And then last but not least, in Presidex dexmedidomidine, you can see that there are 9 to 15 hertz spindles. So this might be specific signatures depending on what kind of anesthetic you're using. This could be useful. So these specific uh, signatures are based on anesthetics uh, that are used, and conf but confounders have to be accounted for. Ischemia, hypoxia, ICP, seizures, and focal injury. Should EEG be used in the operating room? There's some, um, some uh, meta-analyses and guidelines that have been developed. This is just um, by, by one big agency. They, uh, they concluded that EEG monitoring should be considered as part of the vital organ monitors to guide anesthetic management. And, but but the, um, uh, anesthesiologists should be encouraged to be knowledgeable in basic EEG interpretation, such as raw waveform spectrogram and process indices. So meta-analyses support the use of the EEG in the OR, but it requires knowledge of waveforms. How about the ICU? It's not so much data on that yet. Um, very early on, EEG was already used in the critical care setting, mostly to guide um, barbiturate administration in patients that had elevation of ICP, for example, in a TBI patient. And here you can see an example. This was before the widely available uh, use of IC, direct ICP monitors. You can see that the spectrogram dramatically changes after barbiturate bolus is given. And you can even see how long it lasts. So this is has been conceptually been used there. EEG does correlate with levels of consciousness. If you look at different analysis, this is, for example, alpha power, so just the power, the activity in the alpha frequency range, or the complexity of the signal, and it's called theta permutation entropy. You can see that conscious to unconscious patients, even with brain injury, these were patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage, looked quite different. If you look at these indices, and you predict the behavioral exam, the EEG is very accurate and potentially more accurate than just looking at the sedation level, the neuro exam, or other things. Does this translate to other conditions? So in this group, um, Jacobo Sitz um, in a group in Paris, they looked at patients with chronic brain injury and they found very, very similar patterns. So this may be generalizable beyond the acute or the subarachnoid hemorrhage setting. This is probably a phenomenon we can see in many. Uh, many conditions. So the ICU in the ICU, EEG correlates with level of consciousness. Now going more focused on what I'm asked to talk about, EEG in paralyzed patients, neuromuscular blockade has no effect on consciousness and or the EEG. Um, it does abolish EMG activity. So in some studies, when you just look at 
um, quanti uh, quantitated EEG like the BIS, you see a dramatic change when neuromuscular blockers are given, but that's probably just because the, mus uh, the neuromuscular uh, signal goes away. The EEG may be there for a good monitor for uh, sedation. So I'll just show you some experience that we had early on in COVID. So this um, is just a recent publication in uh, Lancet where we looked at the epidemiology. So 22% of critically ill COVID patients, of COVID patients were critically ill, 70% required mechanical uh, ventilation um, of those critically ill patients and 25% uh, required neuromuscular uh, blockade. Um, assuring adequate sedation was particularly challenging in these patients because there was limited access to the patients. Many were paralyzed and some were prone. So using a very limited montage, just a frontal montage, we looked at just the EEG that we recorded from that and uh, just said, had the epileptologist say, reduce uh, sedation or maintain the sedation, did this, and uh, looked six hours later how often we then had to go back up on sedation or had to change our management. Um, here is a quantitative analysis of that. And we did find in these patients that only 12% of patients that were recommended to lower the sedation, we needed to go back up on sedation. So the EEG, this is just very early evidence, but suggestive that the EEG could be used to guide sedation in these patients. You, can this be automated? When we looked at quantitative EEG um, and not having the epileptologist look at it, the quantitative EEG easily separates the patients that have excessive versus those that have adequate sedation. So we may not need to bother an epileptologist. And if this can be automated in a simple way, this may be more applicable throughout the world. Um, this automation has been shown to in, in, uh, in other settings. So EEG-based tracking of the level of consciousness and delirium has been proposed by this group. Um, and it seemed to correlate quite well with RAS scores. And um, this um, group from uh, Brandon Westover from MGH, they actually had the mouse model where they had the EEG analysis um, uh, guide a pump administrating the me medication and thereby just automatically sedating the, the, the mouse. So could this be in the uh, future a closed loop where the EEG directly guides the administrative function of medication? Again, many, many obstacles before we would do this. Um, and we have to look at confounders first. The BIS is a quantitative measure that reflects mostly um, in these cases, um, it reflects also muscle activity. That's a big concern, neuromuscular blockade without sedation had been given in one study here in 11 healthy volunteers and it caused a dramatic fall in BIS. So just using that to guide our therapy might be dangerous. In the ICU, there's huge variability of BIS numbers. So that might not be the answer, but the potential is there. So last but not least, EEG guided sedation may be feasible in paralyzed ICU patients and could be optimized. Thank you very much for your attention.